Hey guys, and welcome to the Strong Tower Mental Health Podcast, where you will be inspired, encouraged, and transformed with powerful teachings and real stories of mental health. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling. If you are in a crisis, call or text your local crisis center or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Jesus is in our mental health, and freedom is where we start. I am your host, Heidi Mortensen, licensed marriage and family therapist. Get ready. Today's show is going to bring you hope. Well, hello. Welcome to the Strong Tower Mental Health Podcast. I am your host, Heidi Mortensen, licensed marriage and family therapist. And I'm really excited to have with me my new friend, Tyler Feller, um, who is a man of many things. He's doing a lot for the kingdom. Um, He actually wrote a book called Don't Stop and a devotion that goes with it. Um, So this is, we'll be talking about this today and some of his testimony and what God has done in his life. Um, So thank you, Tyler, for being here. Thank you so much, Heidi, for having me. And I'm looking forward to our conversation today. A lot of my friends have been on your show, so that's really cool. I'm glad to join them. I love that. I love that you're calling them friends. It's so cool. So tell me about you. Like, where are you from? Like, you know, what do you do? How did God get a hold of you? Yeah, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, but I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Missouri where the population was about 244 people. I always say it's not right growing up when there's more cows than people and uh, a cow's your best friend. That's not right. (laughs) I don't actually mean it though, but my heart was just captured from the Lord. I was like one of those kids that um, the church fan picked up every week to go to church and had amazing people that were a part of the local church there that really prayed for me and Help me become who I am. And I, there was a time where I felt called into ministry when I was in high school, like a freshman in high school. And my pastor at the time, who was also my bus driver, who had also been my elementary basketball coach, that tells you how small the town is that yes. I was in. Like the same people have to do everything. He felt like from the Lord that I was called into ministry. And so I actually mm-hmm. confronted me about it. And I'd been writing these sermons in this notebook that I was scared to tell anybody about. But he kind of just broke the ice and gave me an opportunity to to start preaching and speaking. And actually, I I started traveling and and ministering even at that age and spoke at a ton of churches throughout my high school years and just saw God do really incredible things. And, you know, that that to me is sort of the heart that I want to have for everybody. It's like figure out what God's called you to do and then go Mm -hmm. after it. Yeah, I mean, that's. I think it's amazing. In your book, you actually talk about um, a time where when you were 10, Mm -hmm. you had to do this kind of pretend class president thing and you became the the president and that there was a teacher that actually spoke over you accidentally and called you preacher. Um, And as I was reading this, I was like, no, that's from God. And that God does that. We'll think it's a mistake or we'll think that, you know, God will use people even if they're not Christians. And because that was his call, that was his will for you and so that it's going to happen and i feel like so many of so many people are like oh you know it's not i don't know what god's will is or you know we're just kind of like in a funk or we're just kind of not motivated or excited so how how talk a little bit about how god gave you the idea for this book and yeah where where he showed you to write this book yeah well first off i love that story because i was in a school that wanted to teach us about the electoral process. And so they had sort of like every class and they could nominate somebody and they'd have to win and they'd go to the other classes. And I ended up winning president in my school, the United States of America. It's great. I think I, they honestly, they should have gave it to me. I could have been the president then I should be the president (laughs) now. Uh, But (laughs) then career day rolled around. And so I was like, I guess I'm the president. I'm going to dress up as the president. And uh, I had a little tag that said, president, but the school counselor was going and taking a class photo of everybody who dressed up and the picture I think is in the book. And so she's going to each person. She's like, you're going to be a bull rider. You're going to be a basketball player. And then she gets to me and she's like, you're going to be a, probably she could see the front of it, preacher. And for some reason like that just hit my soul. And mm-hmm. I took off my tag and put it sort of in the inner pocket of my jacket because I wanted people to guess what I was for the rest of the day, because somehow Mm -hmm. that word preacher resonated more with my soul than president. And I didn't think I could be good enough to be a preacher. Somehow I thought I could be the president, but I didn't think I could be good enough to be a preacher. But in my heart, that's the level of respect and honor that I had for people in that position. And honestly, from a spiritual perspective, it's true. 
you can build a nation, but nations rise and fall, but you can build the church and it lasts for eternity. And so when you're a preacher or a pastor, you're actually doing something that's way more impactful than if you were elected to any governmental office. And when I wrote the book, Don't Stop, I wrote it for people like me that felt the call of God on their life in a certain area. And then maybe they hit their early 20s and just had some resistance. And sometimes that resistance comes from dumb decisions that we make on our own. And other times it comes from we're in bad environments. So I call that being touched by evil, where ah, it's really good. no fault of your own. Somebody from yep. an external source have encroached on your territory and marked you. And mm-hmm. it was really a tactic from the devil. And then sometimes we just are not well conditioned to be righteous and holy in all the ways that we should be. And we hit some resistance because of that. And we have to be able to have that resilience to overcome those things. And so that's what the book is. I wrote it with some friends of mine and in my heart that I know are not doing the thing that God called them to do. And so this book's to help people step out of whatever trauma that they've been sort of living in that's prevented them from being all that they're supposed to be. Hmm. That's good. So how because I, this is something as a therapist and even me and my personality is my friendship. And I will often, this is not a good thing. will like work harder than my clients or I'll see someone and I'm like, I know God's call. I'm like, they're amazing. And all these things. And I, I want to kind of push, push, you know, what I think God wants for them. And, and they're just maybe not ready or they have trauma. Like, I, I just feel like we avoid our problems so much. And, and, and Paul talked about that and that you wrote this in your notes that um, that we need to rejoice in adversity. So yeah. how do we do that? And what is the benefit when we do that? Well, I think there's a lot to that that maybe I can unpack some. But one of the things is if you're in a helping relationship, even if it's just with a friend, then you wait for moments of opportunity or sacred spaces to speak into things where it's like they're the ones who open the door and then usually it's small windows, but you're given an opportunity with a gentleness and the, you know, kind of an urgency from the Holy spirit, but a a kindness with it to speak into an area of their life where maybe sometimes they're closed off from. And that's one of the things that was happening with me was like, I had gone through some trauma and some things that I needed to overcome and I would freeze up or I'd have these bad moments. And it was like, a blind spot that I felt like I was hiding to the world around me, but they could all see it. And that I wasn't always ready or, or willing to let people speak into it. And I had a pastor that, you know, was very kind and spoke into those areas in my life and it gave me freedom. And so I think that's a big part of it. It's like, we need to be willing to, uh, allow people to speak into us. And then if we're trying to help somebody, Jesus uses the parable of the farmer often. It's like some people plant a seed, some people water a seed, but God's always the one who brings the, the fruit from it. We can't harvest, create fruit. But what we can do is wait for moments of opportunity, those sacred spaces with other people, and use it under compulsion of the Holy Spirit to very gently speak a word of encouragement. If we're close enough friends with them, speak to a blind side maybe that they have a blind spot that they have and really help encourage them to their destiny. We honor people to where they could become. So we want to speak to, to the, their future. Uh, I, uh, my little nephew, he's like not little anymore. He's like married and 20 years old, but whenever he was younger, he was really skinny. And I, I would be like, man, have you been doing push ups? Yeah, the, dude, your arms are looking big, dude. What have you been doing? And I was just really declaring over him what he could become. Wow. Like, hey, you might be think everybody might be talking about how scrawny you are, but man, one day you're going to be big and strong. And he is, he's big and strong now. And it's Come just on. declaring mm-hmm. that over somebody. And that's kind of mm-hmm. what, what you want to do when you see somebody that's mm-hmm. like, you know, off in left field. You're like, you're, you know, it's like people used to go on American Idol can't sing good at all. And they think they're good. And then they get mad when Simon Cowell would kick them off. Mm-hmm. It's like somebody needs to tell them. And so mm-hmm. when we have friends that are doing something, even if they're a little bit good at it, They might not be great at it, or they might not be in their God thing. And that's what we really want. We want people to step into the thing that they were created to do. Hmm. That's good. So how, I guess, how do we know what that is? I mean, I think, because when we fail a lot, that often could be what God is calling us to. So how do we know what that is? And how can we kind of listen, not give up on the things that maybe could be the God thing, but we're not quite sure? Yeah, it's learning to hear God's voice. I talk about getting on his frequency in the book. And I think it's okay to evolve. Like I had a friend recently that uh, 
was in one career and then he felt like the Lord was calling him to step out and start doing another thing where he was actually making some goods and selling them and it provided well for him for a couple of years. And he wanted to almost live in that identity, but I felt like it was transitional. And so I was able to just encourage him like, hey, not everything has to be forever. Like Mm. that was a season. You can step out of that and into this next thing. Sometimes God uses transitional moments in our life. So we have to be mindful that just because we feel called to one thing when we're 21, when we're 31, we might be called to something else. And when we're 41, we might be called to something else. And so I think that's part of it. But Mm. the prayer in the Bible that I teach actually, the prayer in the book that I teach actually comes from the Bible is just speak, Lord, your servant is listening and ready to respond. It's just a simple prayer. I say it all the time. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening and ready to respond. Simple as that. And if you begin to say that again and again and again, then you're able to get clarity into whatever that thing might be. And by the way, you might be eight days old or 88 years old. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. You're never too young or too old to start being used by God. Colonel Sanders was 62 when he started KFC. Martha Stewart was in her 40s when she started building her empire. Laura Come Ingalls on. Wilder didn't publish Little House on the Prairie until she was 65. Mm-hmm. Susan Boyle was 48 when Simon Cowell discovered her on Britain's Got Talent. The Marvel Universe didn't make its introduction with Stan Lee until he was in his 40s. It's never too late for us to mm-hmm. start pursuing what God's put inside of us. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so good. That's so encouraging. I'm actually in a transition time right now, so I listen to this. I've owned a business for 16 years. And I just sold it at the beginning of this year. And it was learning how to listen to his voice because my, you know, my identity could totally be wrapped up in that. I'm this business owner and this is great. And everybody sees me as that way. And, you know, you're connected in the community. And it was like, I could just sense that God was like, nope, we're done with that assignment. I've got something new for you. And so even in the transition, it's awkward and -hmm. it's hard, but I trust and I know that God is here with me and he's with me in it. Um, and so your, your book is very encouraging, like during that time, during that transition time, um, for us to continue through and to see what God's opportunities are and to know, you know, like what, what is, because he can use even those, those bad times and he can use the mistakes or what we think are mistakes. I think that's some of the point of the book. It's like, you're, Mistakes, your struggles don't define you, but they actually are opportunities. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, and I think that we can put too much of our identity on the thing, like on what we're doing. Like, you know, I am a business owner. I am a therapist. It's like, no, those are things that I do. Like God's using me in those things, Yeah. but that's not who I am. Um, and I think some people, this is new for them. So can you maybe kind of talk about that? Like, what is our identity in Christ and how how can we get a hold of, like, I, as we were talking, I kind of just saw this vision of like, I'm a child of God and we might do this and we might do this. And like, yeah. we have all these different adventures and things that we do throughout our life, but yeah. the adventures don't define us. The jobs don't define us. The things we're doing don't define us. So can you talk about that? Well, I think if people are not careful, instead of having a codependent relationship with a person, they have a codependent relationship with the thing, with their job, mm-hmm. with their identity. Oh, that's good. With their workplace or whatever. That's and, good word. And yeah. Then they end up almost living sometimes in an identity of what they want other people to perceive them as. And that's very unhealthy because the only thing that we can do that allows us to step into what we're talking about today, which is this grand calling, this thing that God's created us to do is have a deep rooted identity in, in him. And so one thing I always say is um, if we say what God says about us, we'll see what God sees in us. And it will start to correct some of those places in our heart where it's like, first and foremost, you know, I'm a child of God. And first and foremost, my life is to live for that audience of one and give everything that I do as worship to him. The prize in the pursuit is not anything that I could create or build or accolade that I could receive, but the prize in pursuit is actually Jesus. Mm -hmm. And honestly, a lot of Christians don't even live their life like that. A lot of believers, Mm -hmm. like Jesus is not the main thing. It's like when you read Mm -hmm. the book of Revelation, the first church that's being rebuked is the church that left their first love. It's Mm -hmm. like, thank you, Jesus, for being my doorway into 
almost being able to use Christianity as a scapegoat for all these other somewhat righteous pursuits that are actually done in vain because of the way maybe some people live in their heart. And so my encouragement to people is like, allow yourself to go deep with God. And uh, you can't have a fear of man. Like you can't build a business because that's what people think about you. you. Can't build an identity because that's what you want people to think about you. Who cares what people think about you? And it, it's a fear of man that people have that needs to be broken off. Mm-hmm. And we just need to do the thing that God calls us to do. I think a lot of times the most dangerous place to be is at the center of God's will, although it's the safest place as well. But it's mm-hmm. often in in being at the center of his will that he asks us to sacrifice things that we're not willing to sacrifice had we not got to that place with him. And then the greatest rewards that we see are when we give him the things that we thought we could never give him. Wow, that's really good. You know, before we started recording, we were kind of a little bit talking about this, and I was talking about how I see people who, like, I might be more motivated than them to change or, you know, and, um, which is not a good thing as a therapist. That's, that's, that's me going beyond where their readiness is. And that doesn't mean, cause then I can shame them and all sorts of things. It's not a good thing. And you said something though, that I thought was really valuable that sometimes it's not that they're like, what did you remember what you said? It was like that they're, they're not afraid to do something, but that they're maybe afraid of what God might yeah. do, or can you help? Yeah, we were just yeah. talking, you were talking about like how, you know, sometimes people don't want to step into the fullness of what it means to understand a biblical view of Jesus's ministry, that what he did in the Bible can be done today, essentially. And so that all of these amazing things that we see in the Bible could happen today. And then we're just talking about some Christians are passive in that. And I said, sometimes they're passive in that because they're actually afraid that they might ask God for something and he won't do it. So they might ask God for healing, might ask God for a prophetic word, might ask God for a miracle. And then how do they wrestle with a God who who says no, with a God who doesn't give them something that they were pursuing in him? And so they just don't go after it. So can you answer that? (laughs) Well, there's a lot of different nuances to it. You know, sometimes we don't receive things from God because we're going about them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So like with Moses, one of the things that he prayed, he said, teach me your ways so that I can grow in your favor. And mm-hmm. so we have to learn the ways of God. So like in, in, in one thing that I teach a lot about, I just got done teaching in a spiritual growth academy with a guy named Sean Bowles on how to pray for healing. So people can go do that if they want. We did a four-week class on that. Um, cool. A lot of people go after praying for healing, but they go about it the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that God's not like willing to heal. It's that they haven't learned the ways of God in that individual category. Not that there's a formula that you can use. And sometimes it's called the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. So what Randy Clark calls it. It's like, sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. I don't know why he doesn't answer. So sometimes it's us learning the ways of God. Other times it's because we have impure motives in our heart. Like when you approach God with a pure motive and, um, a deep connection to what he's wanting to do, you're going to see God show up and and prevail. And actually spending time in the prayer closet is as much about listening as it is about talking, because Mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're calibrating our heart to God. It's Mm -hmm. we're not like, we're not like going to him and saying, these are all the things I want you to do. Like he's some cosmic Coke machine in the sky that you can put a prayer in and get an answer out. We're going, we're going to him and we're saying, Hey, recalibrate my heart to what your desires are. And when we get to that pure place in him, that's when we see amazing results in our life happen because we're coming to a place of purity. So sometimes God doesn't show up because we're going at it in the wrong way. A lot of times people who are afraid to see God show up in their life give the most impossible scenario to God. It's like a family member is brain dead in the hospital and they've never believed that God could heal. And then all of a sudden they believe they want to go after prayer and believe that God could heal in this one moment in their life. And they've never cultivated a life of even believing in miracles. They've never cultivated a deep prayer life with him. And so then because they're in this desperate moment in their life, they give it to God. And then if he doesn't show up, they choose to be mad at him for yeah. the next 15 years. Yeah, It's that's like, good. you're mad at something that the devil did. You're not mad at what God did. Yep. Where You that's haven't good. spent 15 years planting good seeds and sowing mm-hmm. into it. You wanted, so you wanted an instant microwave thing happening. Yeah. So what so many of us 
are doing is we're mad at a God that we actually don't even really know. Because exactly. we've, we've never taken the time to actually really get to know his heart. And that, like, in the failures and in the difficulties is when we can get to know God's heart. I mean, like, I mean, that's where, and that's what I love about your book, where it's like, no, keep going. Like, yeah. God is in this. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why things don't always happen so quickly with God is because the goal isn't for things to happen quickly, but it's for us to be sanctified. And mm -hmm. so the great adventure in our life, the adventure of a lifetime with God is actually a process of sanctification where we go in different domains in our life to becoming Christ-centered. So I'm going to become Christ-centered intellectually. Then I'm going to become Christ-centered emotionally. Then I'm going to become Christ-centered in, you know, in my work life. And then, and so like that doesn't happen in an instant. We have to work really hard on all of those things to go from like growing in Christ to becoming Christ-centered. And then as soon as we you know, are able to accomplish being Christ-centered in an area of, of our life, then we have a, a good, gracious God that points out another thing that we need to give over to Him. I mean, huh. I think it's beautiful that we get an opportunity with God to experience His mercy and grace in that way, and that He's actually doesn't demand perfection out of us instantly. Yeah, I just interviewed a woman who was talking about praising God in the problems, praising God in the difficulties. And so I've actually been doing that, and it was like hard to get it out of my mouth. Like I was like, like yeah. almost like choking on the words to get them out, but I like spoke them out. And as soon as I did, I started to see God's heart. It was like, this is what you want, God. This is what you want. It was like it shifted things, but I had to like release it into his praise. I had to yep. do, I had to do it instead of continue to keep focusing on what is not. Right. And I, I think that that's what is so hard for us is we can get so focused. So can you talk a little bit about are blind like what are personal and spiritual blind spots you talk about this in the book how do they stop us from god's vision and god's will for our life well i think one of the most important things to do is to have a group of friends that you can be vulnerable and honest with if you don't have that then you do live your life in silence in a lot of ways that the things that you're really dealing with are not able to get out hmm. and so the best thing to do is get a group of people that you can meet with in some regular rhythm where people are sharing vulnerabilities. And I think it's in that that those blind spots come out. I know that's so hard. I know that's so hard. But mm -hmm. I have friends in my life that I have to call and say like, hey, this thing, I just want your advice on this thing. Knowing my past, knowing my history, knowing, you know, sometimes the unexaggerated version of myself could end up how do you feel about this? And then giving them an opportunity to speak into it. Like, no, I don't think you should do that. Or I think it's okay. I'm glad we're talking about it. Let's pray about it. I think that is actually the best place for us to be. You spend time with people like that. They're going to say, dude, you're not spending time in the word of God. You're not, dude, I haven't seen you at church in, you know, six weeks. Like you have, you don't have a deep relationship with God and you're coming in here acting like you have you know, something super spiritual from a mountaintop, but really that's your flesh. It's time to crucify the flesh. You have to have people that can speak o openly, vulnerably, and where you give them permission to do that, where they'll receive it. And so that type of sort of like covenantal friendship is, mm -hmm. I know, rare, but it's maybe the most important thing that we can have in our life if, if you're talking about blind spots. So good. I um, am, you're speaking like totally my language. I'm certified in Brene Brown's daring way and this whole concept that she teaches is vulnerability because that's the research she found was what makes connection and so if we're not able to be vulnerable you're not able to be connected if you're not able to be connected you can't be yourself and you're you're not able yeah. to truly be you which is where you're talking about blind spots so you're just like trying to do the things but there isn't a place for you to actually speak out yeah. and eat and get to know the blind spot so you're making up stories that are not true like yeah. i'm no good or i'm worthless yeah. or this person did that or and we just kind of live in this making up stories life that it, it's not going to help us and we're going to end up being now i don't want to say nominal christians but just yeah we're not going to see the more of god yeah i always say you are who you are when no one is around so when you're choosing to be vulnerable, you're allowing yourself into those different spaces of 
your version of yourself when you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the, the biggest keys that you need when being vulnerable, this is something that Brene talks about, is you need two things in the arena. You need people who are able to have empathy. So you can't have somebody like you're being vulnerable and you're like, that's stupid. Why would you say that? Or like there's so many empathy misses that we have that like squashes that. So you need to find the right people, like you're saying, find the right people. And then the, the second one is self-compassion. So you have to actually have compassion for yourself because you're going to mess up. And it's that grace that God gives us where it's like, he's like, I love you no matter what. You can keep messing up and I'm right here with you. And we have to be able to do that for ourselves. So good. Yeah, the Bible says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And uh, it's such a powerful tool to to remind ourselves really what God says about us. And I think those declarations of our faith can help repeat can help create a repeat of God's words over us instead of really what the devil tries to put those negative things that you talk about. Yeah. And something that I think is interesting about your history is that you grew up in a pretty um, Baptist environment and still preach in that kind of environment and God is moving and all churches. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the more of God that you have experienced because even like to me when I I didn't even know about prophecy until like five six years ago can you talk about how that is valuable and that is important that because even the word preacher when you heard when you were 10 like the Holy Spirit was on that yeah. and you could feel it God was moving like that's the Holy Spirit moving and so often we just know the Bible and we don't know yeah. don't know how to partner with the Holy Spirit can you talk about how that can help us get out well, of these ruts as well. One of the things that I realized early on in my ministry was some of what you're talking about, where it's like, hey, I really want this person to be right with God, or I really want this person to be whole and healed from this thing. And you can't do the work for them. Mm -hmm. But I started recognizing and realizing that if people could have an encounter with God, it's like, a, no offense to you as a therapist, it's like a thousand therapy sessions. Like one moment, one yes. encounter with God actually then, like shh, changes everything. Mm -hmm. And so just from an experiential spiritual standpoint, recognizing and realizing that both in my own life and from a ministry standpoint, and then just really having to reconcile from an intellectual or theological perspective, why do some people feel like some things that happen in the Bible no longer can happen today? And why do some people think they are still for today? Mm -hmm. And then wrestling with that from an intellectual and theological perspective, I just had experienced too much already and saw God do too much after me sort of going on that exploit with him to realize that what Jesus did in the Bible can happen today, which the majority of his ministry was hit, was spent doing healing and deliverance. If you actually look at just what he did with his boots were on the ground and sort of put percentages to it, most of what he did with his life was healing and deliverance. And by the way, when somebody re received deliverance, he would call it healing. It was one and the same. And it okay. sort of goes back to what it means to have salvation. Having salvation, and this goes all the way back to the book of Exodus with the Passover, it means that we are healed from our worst disease, our sin sickness, so we're saved, healed from diseases in our body, delivered from the oppressor of the enemy, and then given an opportunity to step into our destiny. That's what salvation means, those four things, that we are saved, that we are healed, that we are delivered, and that we can step into our destiny. That's what salvation means. And so understanding just the history of our faith and understanding what Jesus mm -hmm. did at the Last Supper, he took four drinks from a cup, each time declaring one of those four things. I think people read it and they're like, oh, he's saying this symbolically. No, he's saying it because it means something to our life. So all of that to say, um, helping people have those real encounters with Jesus and having them myself and believing that he can do those things today are, to me, the most important parts of what we can do. And I don't think it matters what denomination you're a part of. Certainly, you have to watch your language because some people are more open to things being said certain ways. Like that word prophecy can be a trigger word in certain environments, mm -hmm. but you might say, I felt like God spoke to me and they receive it. Mm -hmm. or is it okay if I just pray for your, you know, pray for you to be healed real fast? Everybody's pretty much open to that, but doing it in a way that's palatable and the Holy Spirit does the hard work because we're not, <laughs> we're just his vessels anyways. Say, come Holy right. Spirit. And then people begin to have those encounters. 
That's so good. How how do we do that? How does somebody begin that? How can somebody cultivate that and start to be someone who can bring encounters for others? Yeah, I think that the there's a term that we use sometimes called impartation. Impartation is a really important part of the process. I think you can receive an impartation direct from God himself. You could spend time in prayer and fasting and say, Lord, I really want to be used by you to be a carrier of the gospel, to be a carrier of your presence, and you can have an encounter with God. But we also see in Scripture, like in Moses, Moses was given this ability to pray for his leaders. His leaders were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the gifts that Moses had were on them, and then they were empowered. We see in the New Testament, Paul tells Timothy, don't neglect the gifts that you receive when the elders laid hands on you and prayed for you. And there was an impartation that took place from the elders to Timothy, and then Timothy was to fan into flames the seeds of the gift that were brought into you. So really understanding that there are leaders that carry things that they can pray over you that you can receive. And that's what we call impartation. It's very biblical, scriptural. There's a thousand scripture references that we can point back to it. But putting ourselves in positions to receive that. Mm. And then when we do that, we have to be good stewards of what we receive. It's not like you instantly become the next Billy Graham if you get the gift of evangelism. However, you get an opportunity to to cultivate that gift with the Lord and then grow in it over time. That's so good. I feel like I can ask you anything. <laughs> does, does, does that, do people get that with you or they like can ask you? I'm anything? really good at being asked questions. So I yeah. love being interviewed for that reason. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I would like go off on like, okay, I got this question. I got this question. I got this question. And you would be like, okay, let's go. Where are we going to go? Like whatever yeah. treasure hunt the Lord is taking you on You're, I feel like you're totally open to it. Yeah. Yeah, I know so I love is, that. I'm like, I told the the team from that spiritual growth academy. I'm like, I know you guys asked me to teach about healing, but I can teach about like anything. If you guys, if you have another class you want me to teach, yeah, yeah, like it's really, and I, I like that you use the word palatable because that's something like for me, kind of my journey of like learning. Okay, how do I actually speak this so they receive it? And for me, it was more listening to the Holy Spirit instead of trying to operate from my flesh. Like I was more motivated for them to say, "Thank you for that word, Heidi." You know, like I had more motivation behind that. So my heart wasn't always in, in the, I mean, it wasn't bad, but like yeah. God was able to help me like let go of my flesh yeah. and learn how to be more of a vessel. And that, yeah. that was hard for me. Yeah. I think too, I've heard too many stories of people not getting that sort of like instant satisfaction of yes. giving out something to yes. I realize so much that it's like God does things that we don't even see. And so we just have to be faithful with what we feel like mm-hmm. we're supposed to do and don't let the results impact knowing what we're supposed to do. And that's hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Well, what, what else would you like to share that we haven't shared before I have you pray? I would just encourage people, like if they feel like they're walking around hopeless or purposeless, that they don't have to stay in that state, that they can actually step out into what's an adventure of a lifetime. God created them in their mother's womb. He knitted them together. He formed them. When they were born, he was the one that breathed breath into them. It was his breath that filled their lungs, and he declared that they were fearfully and wonderfully made. And from the foundations of the earth, he created something special for them to accomplish, something that literally only they can accomplish. And I would encourage them to figure out what that is by spending time in the disciplines of our faith and intimacy with him, prayer, Mm -hmm. fasting, giving, being a part of a local community, being in a smaller group where people are able to speak into their life. And then Mm -hmm. once they're cultivating that, those disciplines of their faith and they posture themselves, they're going to see God show up in, in ways they've never thought were possible. I always call it the adventure of a lifetime because he (laughs) formed them, because he formed you that are watching. He put these deep desires in your life. He knows what is the most fun thing for you to do. He, if you're an extreme extrovert, he's not going to put you into some office by yourself where you don't get to talk to anybody for three weeks at a time because he formed you to be a certain way with certain predispositions, certain talents and skills. He doesn't want to hide those things. He wants to accentuate those things. It's not selfish or narcissistic for you to say that you were created in a way by God to be used in a way by God. It's mm-hmm. actually embracing the way that he wants you to be. And so I would just encourage people, step into what God's created you to do, and it's going to be fun. Mm, I love it. Can you pray for us? 
Yeah, so Lord, we thank you for every single person that's going to watch this video and watching it even right now. Lord, I pray just peace to every single cell that's carrying anxiety um, in the name of Jesus. Every single cell that that is um, feeling like it has to measure up. Just Lord, I pray there's just a recalibration that begins to take place. And Lord, I thank you that you've called people for such a time as this, that you put them on this earth to accomplish something in this season that only they can accomplish. And so, Lord, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus for uh, them to have bravery as a side effect of the Holy Spirit, to take leaps of faith with you and to step out into the center of your will. And Lord, I pray that they'd be overwhelmed by your Holy Spirit, that they would have these divine encounters with you, that you would speak to them just as you did in the Old Testament with a fire by night and a cloud by day, that you would speak to them on the way that they should go. Like your word says, whether to the right or the left, we'll hear your whisper. Lord, I pray that you activate your voice so loud. That's what felt like silence before will feel like you shouting in a megaphone. Lord, I pray that um, you'll activate their ability to hear your voice, that they'll get on your frequency, and they'll step into everything that you've called them to do. And we break off any trauma from the past. We break off any mistakes that they keep playing on repeat. We break off anything that they feel like has disqualified them from stepping up or living into the best that you have for them. And I release right now everything that you have in store for them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This has been great. How can people get a hold of you and purchase your book and the devotion? Yeah, um, you can just go to tylerfeller.com and there's links on there to purchase the book. Uh, it will take you to Amazon. It's also being carried in several Barnes and Nobles, so you might check your local Barnes and Noble if that's how you get books. Yeah, and I'm going to just spell your name. It's T Y L E R, F as in Frank, E as in Edward, L as in Larry, L E R. Dot com. So you can go and check it out on his website um, and also on social media. So thank you, Tyler. This has been wonderful having you. Yeah, thank you so much, Heidi. It was such a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Strong Tower Mental Health Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen. Your review helps the show reach more people and spread mental health awareness with Jesus at the Center. You can also check me out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or my website at HeidiMortensenLMFT.com. See you at our next episode.